Bu akşamın konuşmacısı Profesör Michael Fitzgerald, kendisi Connecticut'ta, e, Hartford'ta, Trinity College'de sanat tarihi profesörü. Modern sanat ve Picasso üstünde çok değişik yayınları var. Pek çok serginin küratörlüğünü yaptı. Picasso ve modernizmin doğuşu, Picasso ve bir sanat ortamının yaratılması gibi ve en sonunda gene Picasso ile ilgili, Picasso ve Amerikan sanatı ile ilgili New York'taki Whitney Museum'da bir serginin küratörlüğünü ve kataloğunu yazdı. Kendisi bize bu akşam Picasso ve yaşamındaki diğer şahsiyetlerle ilgili sanatın merkezinde bir yabancı konulu konuşmayı yapacak. Evet. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and I so much appreciate the invitation of the museum to come to see this wonderful exhibition that I'm so pleased that so many people are coming to see and also to have the opportunity to see Istanbul which has been a revelation for me and I hope to come back very soon. Uh, I also would like to apologize because really the delay is my responsibility. If only I could speak in Turkish then there would be no need for a translator. So uh, my apologies but uh, Unfortunately, that is my limitation. I'm going to be talking tonight not so much about what Picasso did in the studio, the process of creating his works of art, and I'm sure many other speakers previously in this program have done that, but rather to talk more about what happens outside the studio, the way in which Picasso's reputation was developed, and the way in which he became, for most of us, the most influential artist of the 20th century, and even up into the beginning of the 21st century. I'll do that in two ways. First, talking about Picasso's relationship with his dealers in the early years of his career in which he was becoming established. And then secondly, the responses of artists, particularly American artists, to his work, because it really was in America that his reputation was most firmly established and which it had the greatest influence on artists uh, up to the current day. I'm beginning with two images, two self-portraits that Picasso made in 1901, just at the beginning of his time in France. And it is important to emphasize what is, in a sense, obvious that Picasso was Spanish. Uh, that may seem to be entirely obvious to all of you, having seen the exhibition, but in fact it's something that was almost forgotten for much of the 20th century, because after all, most of Picasso's career took place in France, He was often discussed as the greatest artist in France, but often also discussed as the greatest French artist. In fact, he was not that. He was an immigrant in his arrival in France uh, here in 1901. He shows himself on the left as he would like to be, already hoping to be rich and famous and influential, a great man of the world as he is surrounded by two courtesans uh, in the background in his, his tall hat and a uh, black suit. On the right, rather more the way he was, impoverished, unknown, unestablished, an artist uh, who, as a Spaniard coming to France at this time, was really not welcome. He was seen very much as an outsider, someone who had to work very hard to create his career, and you see him now in his very worn clothing, his easel under his arm, standing before the uh, Moulin de la Galette, Uh, the Moulin Rouge, I'm sorry, here on Montmartre as if he would be painting pictures for the tourists who might be coming to Paris to take away. Very much as an outsider at the beginning of his career. It's something that's very hard to remember given the rise to fame and fortune that came about by the middle of the 20th century, but his beginning was in a very different place. The next two slides. The slide on the left, which is the first in this pair, is a portrait of Amboise Vollard, a great dealer uh, at, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, the dealer of Cezanne and Gauguin, among other of the post-impressionist artists. It was with Vollard that Picasso first began to create a substantial relationship. In 1901, Vollard gave Picasso his first major exhibition in Paris. Picasso was linking himself already with the tradition of modern art, of Cezanne and Gauguin, that were only at that point beginning to be established in 1901 at that time. It was a relationship that extended through the great early years of Picasso's career. On the right is 
Picasso's portrait again of Volar, the same man. Uh, perhaps uh, you can recognize him uh, being about 10 years later. He's lost a bit of his hair, uh, but you can still see a mustache now extended into a beard, in this case, and the heavy features of the man. This is, of course, one of his great analytic cubist portraits. Uh, and it's part of a set of three portraits. Could I have the next two, please? Uh, of other individuals that are uh, related to this issue. On the left, I apologize for the quality of the slide, a portrait of Daniel Henry Conviler, who became P Picasso's primary dealer uh, beginning around 1910 as the primary relationship. And on the left, of Wilhelm Uda, another German who was also chief a uh, chief representative of Picasso's career at this time. It's surprising, I think, that the great Cubist portraits that Picasso painted, these analytic Cubist pictures of 1910, are not, say, of other painters or of critics or of poets, but rather of dealers, all of them, dealers and collectors. And it's an indication of how important these relationships were with Picasso. He was, after all, not operating un an under an official system in any way. There was no government patronage that he could turn to. It was only a matter of individuals. And he was building relationships with them, particularly the dealers who were, after all, those who could promote his career, could sell his pictures, who could help him earn a living, and could sh send his pictures around the world to other exhibitions. So the dealer relationships were the crucial ones, and it's evident, I think, in the primary portraits that Picasso painted in his early career, and particularly these great portraits in the analytic cubist years. If not for these three men, and particularly for Conviler, whom you see on the left, cubism might never really have been invented, because Conviler made a great long-term investment. He decided that he would buy everything that Picasso made, and also everything that George Brock made, and of other cubists like Juan Gris and Fernand Leger, and simply believed that this would be great art, that it would ultimately be recognized, that it might be 10 or 20 years before he could sell most of the pictures, but nonetheless, he would have supported the development of that style. It was that private patronage that made it possible for cubism uh, to develop. Uh, the next two, please. Uh, this was beginning to happen by 1914. Uh, there was a great auction held, a public sale uh, called the Bear's Skin, Podolus, uh, in which Picasso's paintings, along with Matisse's, were sold for the first time at public sale. It was the great test of the market and these artists' reputations in a commercial sense. And the major Picasso painting was this one on the right, the family of Saltenbanks, perhaps his most important picture of the Rose Period, a picture from 1905 that's now in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., a picture that brought 12,600 francs at auction, a phenomenal price, possibly the highest price paid for uh, a avant-garde work in the years before the First World War. It seemed to be a tremendous success, and yet the world changed very rapidly with the beginning of the war. On the left is a large slide of a very small notebook that Picasso kept. This was his account of his business dealings. He didn't have an accountant in those days. He kept it himself in his own hand. And he's recording the payments that he received from dealers and, collected, and collectors, his income uh, for the years from 1913 uh, up to the beginning of 1916. And as you'll see, many of the payments have a K next to them, here and here, and they're for substantial sums, 8,000 500 francs, 4,950, 3,250, here another one, 5,688. These are the primary sums that Picasso was earning in these years. And the K, of course, stands for Conviler. These are the regular payments that Conviler gave him for his purchases. And yet, if you look down the list, you come to a big payment on uh, the 8th of June, 1914, for 12,400 francs, uh, the price more or less that that picture sold for, although it's not, the payment is not for that picture. And then if you look, January 1915, how much smaller the sums are, and the fact that none of them have a K next to them. The war began, of course, in the summer of 1914, and Conviler, who was a German citizen, 
uh, had his business confiscated by France. And all of these literally hundreds of pictures that he had bought over the previous years were taken by the French government to be held for reparations against the cost of the war. Ultimately, all of those pictures were sold uh, in auctions in the 1920s, dumped on the market and sold for uh, abysmal prices. So this investment that Kahnweiler made that created Cubism, or that allowed Cubism to be created, was completely lost. And it was not until following the Second World War that Kahnweiler was able to reestablish his relationships with Picasso and other artists and rebuild his business. It's really a terrible story of loss, uh, but also a devastating one for uh, Picasso. The next two slides, please. The slide on the left is of Picasso's great Harlequin from 1915. And Picasso often portrayed himself in the costume of Harlequin. It was an alter ego for him. In this case, it's an extremely mournful figure, one that has a rather skull-like head, uh, this black head that comes up uh, with the grinning mouth across it. And all of it, of course, set on the black background uh, that suggests a mourning card of that time. This is about loss and suffering and death. A painting made in 1915, in the first year of the First World War, one that reflects those circumstances, that reflects what became uh, the mortal illness of his lover at that time, Eva Goel, and also the collapse of the art world, the loss of this development of his reputation that had come up to this point. It's an image that has many touchstones within contemporary times and the fundamental change in the world that came about uh, in 1915. Uh, in a small sense, in a sense, it was devastating for Picasso's career and reputation, as well as for so many other things uh, in uh, Europe in particular. On the right is a small drawing that Picasso made, a portrait drawing of another individual. And yes, yet again, another dealer. In this case, Leos Rosenberg, the man who came to the fore uh, in the midst of the First World War to buy some of the pictures. And many of the entries in the notebook that I showed you earlier on are uh, purchases by Rosenberg in 1915 and uh, 1916. If you look very carefully, you'll see not only Rosenberg standing here, and he is, by the way, standing in his military uniform, the French uniform. You can see uh, the collar piece, the great coat, his hat that he holds at his side. But in the background, if you look at the diamond patterns, it is the Harlequin itself. So this is actually a portrait, not simply of Leons Rosenberg, but Leons Rosenberg as a patron, as a buyer of the great picture that Picasso had made to summarize this period and this experience at the time. It was Picasso's great hope that Rosenberg would fill the space that Kahnweiler had been forced to give up and would lead to another career coming out of the war uh, itself. The next two slides, please. Well, uh, that didn't happen. In fact, Rosenberg found that it wasn't very easy running a business in the middle of a war. Uh, and the pictures that he bought, he was unable to sell. And he didn't have the means to continue to buy uh, in the face uh, of uh, no possibility of sale. What happened, though, rather, was something that was ultimately more beneficial for Picasso, that really was the beginning of Picasso's worldwide reputation uh, in a way that uh, could not perhaps have been possible even with Kahnweiler. And that is that Leos Rosenberg's brother, Paul Rosenberg, stepped forward. And this is a portrait that Picasso made about 1920. I'm sorry, the expansion of the image uh, makes you lose the clarity of the line of the drawing. But it's a drawing of Paul Rosenberg seated in his gallery. Paul Rosenberg was a dealer not simply of modern pictures of contemporary works as Kahnweiler was, but rather all of modern art, going back to Courbet and Delacroix and Ang, as well as the uh, Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists as well. So Picasso came into a very different world there, a much more established world that he became to, a, to be a part of, in a sense, the history of modern art, rather than simply of contemporary art, the avant-garde of the day. And on the right, of course, is a photograph of Picasso taken in 1932 by Cecil Beaton, uh, in his apartments uh, in Paris. His apartments on the Rue La Boisse uh, were next door to Paul Rosenberg's gallery. They really were a team as they built Picasso's reputation in the years just following the First World War, 
through the 1920s and into the 1930s to the point at which Picasso could reasonably say that he had indeed achieved what he had, he had made in that portrait of 1901 uh, in the top hat and the white scarf. Uh, here we have him in a rather similar setting. This, he had achieved his fame, his wealth, uh, his success uh, in a very broad sense. The next two slides, please. In this world, Picasso's art changed dramatically. It reflected his sense of being a part of history, of a history of modern art that went back well into the 19th century, not trying to cut himself off from it, to reject it, to only create something new and different, but to feel a part of this tradition, a new tradition, but still a tradition nonetheless. Uh, and in this case, I'm showing you on, on the left a pastel that Picasso made in 1921 of a bather, a classical form, and what is probably the direct source, a painting by Renoir made around 1900 that was in the gallery, in the inventory of Paul Rosenberg. Picasso literally only had to go into the storerooms of that gallery to look through the history of modern art, and he did that repeatedly, and he found pictures that he then made his own versions of, reflecting his sense of being a part of that history. Uh, the next two, please. But it's not simply that turn to tradition, to classicism, uh, that after all goes back to Roman uh, art uh, and Greek art, but also modernism as well, as we think of it uh, in more extreme terms of cubism uh, in particular. These are the years in which he made pictures such as The Three Musicians of 1921, or in 1932, The Dream, uh, one of his most exquisite portraits of Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, uh, his mistress of that time. These are the years when he was in partnership with Paul Rosenberg, and Paul Rosenberg was building an audience for this tremendous work, large size paintings, extremely impressive pictures that he was creating through the 1920s and into the 1930s. The next two slides, please. As it happens, and it's, it's really quite surprising, I think, the first exhibition of Picasso's work, the first retrospective of his work organized by a museum anywhere in the world was organized in the US, but not as you might expect by the Museum of, Ni of Modern Art, for example, but rather by the Wadsworth Athenaeum, a small museum in Hartford, Connecticut, 100 miles from New York City. It happened in 1934, and these are two photographs of the installation of that exhibition in what was then a radically modern building of that time. In 1934, and everyone came, uh, as you might imagine, to this small city to see this exhibition. It was to a large extent organized, in fact, by Paul Rosenberg. This is a reflection of the activities of the dealer, promoting exhibitions, not simply commercial exhibitions in other galleries, but also in museums, getting the word out, showing pictures so that the public could see them and enjoy them and respond to them. It was this partnership between Picasso and Paul Rosenberg and some of the dealers uh, and curators in America that brought this about. It was really very surprising that this happened in the US, uh, because until only a few years before that, there had been no museums of modern art. This uh, exhibition occurred in 1934. The Museum of Modern Ar Art was established in 1929, the Whitney Museum in 1931. These were very, very new institutions. And in the early 20th century, there had been really no interest in modern art to speak of in America. It was not an established tradition there. And yet a few individuals in the 1920s decided that it was necessary to create museums, private museums, that would support the education and the knowledge about art. Uh, and it resulted in things such as this. this. This period, the tremendously dynamic period of change and focus on art in America, strikes me as being rather like perhaps what's happening here now, seeing this wonderful museum, seeing the uh, Istanbul Modern as well, a great flourishing, it seems to me, of institutions coming about devoted to modern art, and perhaps uh, it will be your opportunity to take the lead uh, in the presentation of modern and contemporary art. I hope so. It really was in the 1930s and the 1940s in America, through the Museum of Modern Art, but also, also through the responses of other artists that Picasso's reputation as we know it, as the primary figure of the 20th century, was established. Can we have the next two, please? And 
Interestingly enough, I think, again, surprisingly enough, to a large extent, that reputation in America, that impact on American culture and ultimately internationally, was not created by Americans. That is, not people born in America, but to a large extent, immigrants to America. It's one of the nice things about American culture that so many people come and change what is there rather than simply leaving it as it was. And the first artist to really have this impact is an artist that we know as John Graham. And this is a portrait of him uh, in the 1930s. Uh, in fact, he was born Ivan Dombrowski in Warsaw. He grew up in Kiev. Uh, and in the years before the First World War, he joined the cavalry of the Russian Tsar. So his background clearly was extremely different. Uh, but with the revolution, he fled Russia. He moved first to France and then ultimately to New York in 1924, where he took root. Uh, but he was an extremely cosmopolitan figure. He was very knowledgeable about the art of Europe, of Picasso in particular. He knew Picasso fairly well. He exhibited uh, in Parisian galleries, major galleries, even though he was living uh, in New York. Could I have the next two, please? And he was one of the first to absorb what we call the neoclassical style of Picasso's art. These exquisitely drawn and yet very broadly painted images on the left is one of Picasso's The Woman in White, uh, which is a painting of 1923, a portrait of his wife, Olga Koklova. Uh, you have other images of her here in this exhibition. And on the right, a painting by John Graham of his wife, Eleanor, uh, that he painted about 1930, when these, fi these pictures, the neoclassical pictures of Picasso, were first being shown in this country. Uh, on the right, please. Graham was equally sophisticated in his absorption of Cubism, particularly the late Cubism of the later 1920s and the early 1930s. If, for example, you think of Picasso's painting, The Dream, which I showed you on that screen a few images back, you'll see one of the sources that Graham was drawing on in this picture, which is called The Queen of Hearts uh, from uh, 1940. The next two slides, please. But really, the artist who had the greatest impact on American art and the absorption of Picasso's art, who really was the catalyst for a fundamental change, a change that, in fact, made American art important in a way that it had not been up to this point, was not Graham, but a friend of Graham's. And you see here on the right a portrait of the two of them together, a photograph taken in the mid-1930s, a Graham on the left, and on the right, uh, Arshil Gorky. On the left is one of Gorky's paintings. He had not had the experience of uh, Graham. He had not ever been to Paris. And yet he had the ability to absorb the style of other artists in a way that no one really could equal. This is a painting on the left that many people would probably say is a work by Cezanne. And indeed, it's very close to the style of Cezanne's work. But in fact, it's a painting by Gorky. And it's a scene of Staten Island which is a small island off of Manhattan within the city of New York, not Provence, uh, as you might expect. He had an amazing ability to absorb, but also to transform and to create his own very personal art. Uh, the next two, please. This is one case uh, of uh, Gorky copying a Picasso, the painting Two Nudes by Picasso on the left of 1920, and Gorky's drawing on the right uh, as it happens, this drawing is on loan to the Gulbenkian uh, with a considerable work, a uh, considerable group of Gorky's work uh, that uh, are held in the collection there. You can see Gorky certainly copying the composition, but also beginning to vary it, to study the details of execution, the way in which Picasso had structured the lips almost as if they'd been carved out of stone, or the way in which he'd drawn the eyes to emphasize the eyelids and the pupils to make it really structural and sculptural as a form that he would then transform uh, into his own work. The next two, please. Gorky, like Graham, was not born with that name. He was born Vostanica Doin, around the area of Lake Vaughan. And we don't know the particular date of his birth, but it was approximately 1900. He lived through the very difficult years of the First World War. His mother died in 1919. 
of disease and starvation. And in 1920, he came to New York and started a new life. And there took the name Arshil Gorky, in part suggesting that his origin was actually Russian rather than as it was, and began to build a career and became there truly one of the most influential artists of the middle decades of the 20th century. His great work, probably, his masterpiece, is this painting on the left, uh, which he painted for a period of more than 10 years. It's now in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, and it's based, as you can see, on the photograph on the right, which records a Gorky with his mother, a photograph taken around 1912, one of the very few things he brought with him when he came to the United States. And you can see that he's transformed it very substantially. Obviously, in terms of his mother's clothing, the floral pattern uh, of uh, her dress is not present uh, in the painting itself. Much of the painting is drastically simplified. And the emphasis is placed on the face, on the eyes, on the evocative, of evocativeness of the individuals. Moreover, he's changed the posture of the figures in significant ways. So, for example, the feet of Gorky turn away from his mother and ultimately a gap opens up between them, not present in the photograph itself. It's clearly an image of separation, of mourning, and of remembrance. It's an image that has been painted and painted and painted many times, layer upon layer of paint, and each layer sanded and smoothed so that it has an almost glass-like surface to the painting, something that he labored on literally for 10 years in the creation of this evocation uh, of his mother, of his lost family. Uh, the next two, please. But it was not simply Picasso's neoclassicism that Gorky had mastered. Much more than that, the contemporary style of Cubism and the relationships with surrealism. On the right is a Picasso painting of the studio, which is in the Museum of Modern Art, that Gorky came to know very well in the early 1930s. And he made his own version of that called Organization. Uh, in fact, this is a, a rectangle in the actual painting. Uh, it's a little bit distorted in the projection. An image that he labored on for three years, at the same time that he was painting the portrait of the artist and his mother. So you see the range of his styles, the way in which he could master two very different techniques, but also to transform what Picasso had done. Because for those who are accustomed to looking at Picasso's work, this is very clearly an image of an artist in the studio. We see the artist here holding uh, his brush, in this case, the rectangle of the palette uh, that he would be holding in his subject, a still life, a fruit, a sculptural head on a table here really actually quite legible, quite uh, representational when one comes to know it. In the case of the Gorky, it's an abstraction. You can see the use of the heavy lines, for example, the white ground that Picasso used, but you can no longer distinguish a figure. What you do have instead, uh, with the movement towards abstraction, is this great black undulating shape in the center of the canvas, which in fact comes from another of Picasso's work, the next on the right. Another in this series called Artist and Model, which is also in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And you can see here the palette that Picasso painted, uh, a figure again of an artist with uh, an African mask as a head, uh, the torso here, uh, painting on a canvas. You can see the tacks in the side of the canvas right here, painting what is a quite classical profile of a figure drawn from this quite unclassical figure to the side. So it's clearly an image about transformation, the possibilities of art to create whole new ways of conceiving reality. Uh, and yet, in this case, the artist is located in a very real sense, seated in a armchair with a floral pattern with fringe falling off below. So it's very tangible, as well as something that is a very uh, conceptual. Gorky threw all that away. He pushed it away. He was moving towards abstraction not representation, but he took the palette and he extended it into this tremendously dynamic form, and it became his primary symbol, the symbol of the artist's creativity, of his own imagination, indeed of his own soul, uh, which he used through many years and many different paintings uh, into the 1940s. Um, the next on the right, please. I said Gorky was tremendously influential, and he truly was. One of his great friends, 
was Willem de Kooning, another immigrant to America from Holland, where he had been trained in the Art Academy. And you see them here in Gorky's studio on Union Square, Gorky standing and embracing de Kooning. And of course, the painting on the easel that they are celebrating is organization. Uh, although at an earlier stage. And this, he, we paint, he painted it for three years and it changed in the process of painting. So it's a reflection of their close friendship, de Kooning along with Pollock, the primary figures of abstract expressionism, but also of de Kooning's dependence on Gorky. It's Gorky's painting that's being celebrated, not de Kooning. And indeed, de Kooning was just beginning his career. And he was very frank after Gorky's death. He said that if any historian wants to establish how my art began. It began in Arshil Gorky's studio on Union Square. That's where I come from, he said. Not from Holland, not from European culture, but from Gorky's studio. So a tremendous impact on the right. Uh, one. And this is just one of de Kooning's early paintings of its based uh, on organization as well as the Picasso works. And of course, this great red undulating form is his version of uh, Gorky's palette that you see here. So this is a direct source uh, between Gorky and de Kooning and the development of the work at the beginning of uh, de Kooning's uh, career. The next two, please. So we come now to Picasso's Guernica. And I'm sure for those of you who have attended these lectures, you've heard a great deal about this painting, a painting that Picasso made in 1937 to try to focus world attention on the civil war that was raging in Spain at that time of his opposition to the takeover of a General Franco that ultimately did occur. This painting was not simply made for a presentation in Paris in the pavilion where it first stood, but to be sent internationally. And indeed, it traveled around the United States through 1939. And when it came to New York, it was exhibited in a gallery there and a small group of people were asked to come and talk about that painting, to interpret it to the general public. There were a few art historians, there were a few critics, and there were a few artists, a very small group. But one of those artists was Arshil Gorky. And it was a reflection of the fact that he was acknowledged as a Picasso scholar, so knowledgeable and important in his understanding of Picasso, and also perhaps uh, because he, uh, more than most of those who might be speaking, understood something of the suffering of war. Uh, Gorky was tremendously influential. Also influential on Jackson Pollock, the other of the founders of abstract expressionism. On the right, I show you one of Pollock's paintings called The Water Bull uh, that is from 1946, just before Pollock established his drip style that uh, is his most known form of painting. It's a painting that's directly based on Guernica, which he knew in New York, saw there in 1939 and in the following years, because Picasso left the painting in New York until it could return to Spain, with Spain being a democracy. Uh, he did not wish the painting to return to Spain until Spain was once again demo uh, democracy, and it stayed in New York until 1981, if I remember correctly. This painting, you can see in terms of format, the proportions are very Short painting and very wide is similar, but particularly if you look at this great arm reaching out that comes back to the profile of this woman extending back, this is what Pollock has captured in the great arc of this arm going back to the features of the face, the ear, and back up. He's clearly generalized. He's transformed. He's not interested in precise figuration, but beginning to create a gesture, a looseness, a sense of spontaneity that he would then translate into his drip paintings uh, of uh, only a year or two following. Next on the left, please. This change that's so dramatic between the water bowl and Guernica, difference between black and white in color, is also based on Picasso's work. This is a painting called The Bullfight. It was also known uh, in New York, the subject, after all, similar to Guernica, which has the goring of the bull at the center of the painting itself. And you can see the similarity of palette uh, and uh, these very rough passages of painting that uh, Pollock was appropriating for his own use uh, in, uh, Pollock, in his own uh, paintings. The next two, please. 
actually due to Pepe Carmel, who spoke here a week or so ago, who's not only a Picasso scholar, but a Pollock scholar as well, we know that Pollock began his classic paintings, these drip paintings, which were made without touching brush to canvas, but rather taking a stick or a hardened brush and a can of paint, spreading out canvas on the floor and allowing it to run, dripping it on or splattering it onto the surface rather than actually touching it to the place. But he began these paintings with a series of drawings rather like this. This is actually a small sheet of a sketchbook. But because of a film that Pepe found and analyzed, we have a record of Picasso actually beginning this painting, which is called number 27, 1951, which is in the collection of the Whitney Museum uh, of American Art. Uh, and he began it with just these kinds of drawings, drawings that come again from Picasso's style, figures such as this, but ones that also have a kind of calligraphic quality in which the line, the structure of the lines begin to define a composition free of the particular subject that's being rendered. He took that uh, in his poured paintings and created these very dense layered designs. But they began with something representational, something based on Picasso. And Pollock said that he was trying to obliterate Picasso, to overthrow him, literally to bury him under the layers of paint that he was creating. The next two, please. De Kooning, as I said, was tremendously close to Gorky uh, and through that close to Picasso uh, as well. And I'm showing you here on the left a, a painting that uh, de Kooning made in the late 1940s, just in the early years of abstract expressionism, that is, of course, based on the Demoiselle d'Avignon of 1907, which came to New York in 1937. You have uh, a very nice tapestry version of this painting on uh, exhibit uh, in uh, the exhibition. What de Kooning has done is to take three of the five figures of Picasso's composition. Uh, this one here being based on the seated figure. Uh, this one being that uh, coming in through the curtain. And finally, this great frontal figure, uh, this strict frontal pose that's based uh, on this figure uh, in the very center, looking out at us. He's dropped the African mass. He's really trying to create a form exp of expression directly through the process of painting, the transformation, the destruction, in many ways, of these figures. In his most famous painting, the next on the right, which is called Woman One, he takes not three figures from Picasso's five, but only one, this figure, which he recreated in this giant canvas, uh, this very massive, powerful figure that he created. It's a painting that draws on many sources, going back to prehistory, to fertility figures, to advertising in popular magazines at the time, but is still fundamentally based on a relationship with Picasso, a sense of establishing himself in relation to this figure of world renown at this point in 1950. Uh, the next two, please. In a sense, this may not be surprising up to this point. Uh, the abstract expressionists were, after all, fundamentally painters and interested in the history of painting. But what about pop art, a movement that seems to be entirely about material culture, the contemporary mass appeal, the commercialization of the modern world that seems so far from art, from high art, from fine art? Well, in fact, Picasso is a fundamental point of reference for the pop artists as well. On the left is a painting by Roy Lichtenstein called Girl with Beach Ball from 1977. On the right, a very early Lichtenstein painting uh, from 1961, uh, the first girl with the beach ball. And if you look simply at the two beach balls themselves, you'll see that there's obviously a relationship between these two works. In fact, this first painting is based on an advertisement in a newspaper, a cheap advertisement for a summer vacation that Lichtenstein took out of the newspaper and transformed into this large, very colorful painting. He then returned to it 16 years after painting this picture and created this image. But if you look at it, it's a much more complex image. There is the arm reaching up, there is the beach ball, there is the girl, uh, but there's something much more about this girl. If you look at the way in which her face is rendered, we have in the background the frontal view that would be like this figure of the early picture. But then we have a profile coming in. And then on top of that, we have a mouth 
coming through that might be the mouth of the previous figure. And we have an eye looking in opposite direction for where the profile should be. This is all about cubism. And it's about a particular picture on the right, please. Picasso's Girl Before the Mirror of 1932, which is in the Museum of Modern Art, a picture that Lichtenstein had admired since the 1940s when he was a student and came back to address in the later 1970s. So here we have Lichtenstein measuring art across a tremendously broad range. On the one hand, the commercial, the contemporary things that we think of uh, as the opposite of art, perhaps. And on the other hand, something that is steeped in tradition. It is the personification of the high tradition of the avant-garde in the 20th century, of Picasso's picture that he's combining almost seamlessly in this extremely complex uh, image. Uh, two more, please. Finally, among the artists to discuss, uh, I come to uh, Jasper Johns, the artist who is generally acknowledged to be uh, the most respected living artist in the world. Uh, he uh, is an artist who ignored Picasso for much of his career, but for the last 25 years has been deeply involved with Picasso's work, who has come back to Picasso in a sense as Picasso later in his career went back to earlier masters of Manet uh, or of Delacroix to establish his relationship to this modern tradition that by this point has been very powerfully formed. On the left is a painting that uh, Johns painted in uh, 1985, a picture called Summer. It's part of a classical series of the seasons. Uh, there is also an image of spring, uh, one of fall, and one of winter. So it is about the passage of time and about the passage of life as well. This painted at a point in which, Picasso, in which uh, Johns was well into middle age, was himself aging and thinking of his career and his position within history now, not simply of the current scene. And it's a picture in which he literally shows himself because this silhouette, the shadow cast on a wall, is John's own silhouette, specifically based on his features. And yet, if you compare it to Picasso's painting called The Shadow of 1953, you see that he got the idea from that. And he's acknowledged this. He said that this is his source for the picture. This is a painting that Picasso made in 1953 at a tremendously difficult time in his life when uh, his lover of that time, Francois Gillot, left him and took with her, uh, her their two, two children, Paloma and Claude, uh, and uh, Picasso was bereft. He was left by himself. He was left feeling that he was old, that he was lost, that in a sense his life was over. Uh, this very sad, very dark time in Picasso's career is what Johns himself is referencing bringing in his own dark shadow, but also this array of objects on the right, an array of objects that, if you know John's work, you will recognize to a certain extent. The paintings of the American flags, not American flags, but paintings of them, which had been at the beginning of John's career in 1955. He had begun to make them. A, an image of the Mona Lisa, of course, a great work within the history of Western art, an array of other images of interest to him as well. The thing is, though, this is not simply a matter of John's thinking back through his career, but also measuring his career in yet another way. The image on the right, please. Measuring again in relation to Picasso. And here we have another painting, in this case, of the Minotaur moving, of pulling this cart jumbled with his possessions. The Minotaur, like the Harlequin, was one of the primary alter egos for Picasso. And in this case, he's not the great figure of classical myth, the powerful beast that could overwhelm anyone, but a lowly figure who has to use his muscles to pull his cart with the few possessions that he still retains upon them. They're not literally his paintings, uh, as they are John's and his, but he's clearly drawn on this, the ladder, the rope, for example, that holds them together. Even the stars that you find here are here uh, in uh, John's work. This was also a painting of a very difficult time in Picasso's life. When uh, his daughter Maya was born to Marie-Thérèse Voltaire uh, in 1934, and it seemed as if all of his private life would explode. Olga Koklova was threatening divorce. It would have caused all of his ar art to be sold. It would have completely disrupted his life. And so it's as if he feels he's been thrown out of his house, and he creates this allegory of that experience. Draw, John's draws on that too. So he's both measuring his position 
advanced in years towards the end of his career in relation to the art he's created, but also, again, the other paradigm, the other great figure of modern art, Picasso, that is always the measure uh, of his work. The next two, please. And then uh, now to the final images uh, of my talk. Uh, this painting on the right, another painting by Jasper Johns, but one that I believe has never been shown in public before, anywhere in the world, in New York or anywhere else in the world. You're the first to see it. It's a painting that has not, has not left John's studio, that is still in his studio in Connecticut. It's a painting that he finished in 2003, only a few years ago. Uh, it's one that he's lending to our exhibition at the Whitney in the fall, and therefore he allows me to show the image. It also is based on Picasso's work, specifically on that painting of 1915 that I spoke of as for Picasso being his emblem of the First World War, the devastating experience of that time. Johns has taken that as the source for his painting. It's a great field, uh, and it is very deeply involved with his work over the past 10 years that I won't uh, trouble you uh, with the explanation of. But if you look at the very bottom, you can see not a vertical figure of Harlequin, but one turned flat, lying down, perhaps as if dead or buried. Uh, the, the pattern, the lozenge pattern of Harlequin's costume, very clearly so. It's called Pyre uh, by its title. And it is a work then that celebrates death the funeral pyre, uh, the fire that burns the corpse of the dead figure. In this sense, then, uh, a work that celebrates the death of Picasso. But after all, a painting that was painted 30 years after Picasso's death in 1973, 30 years in which Picasso has continued to be influential, and particularly to be influential in John's career. So that it is a painting that marks both a sense of closure of the end of death, but also of rebirth, a kind of phoenix, for John's at least, that he takes as an emblem of Picasso's continuing importance in his work, and the work that he creates in this broader sense of a modern tradition that, for the last hundred years, has been defined by Picasso and continues to be defined by Picasso. So thank you very much. Çok ilginç konuşması için teşekkür ediyoruz. Picasso'yu Arşiv Gorki'den, Jasper Jones'tan ne kadar etkisi olduğunu gördük. Efendim sorularınıza cevap gelecek Michael Fitzgerald. <gülüyor> Was it that boring? <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, about uh, Picasso's uh, first exhibit in the world in the United States. I forgot what year it I'm, was about. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You said that uh, uh, amazingly, Picasso's first exhibit took place in the United States. What year was it? Okay. Well, Around? Well, yes, the year was 1934. Okay. But could I clarify? That was, I said that was the first exhibition of Picasso's work organized by a museum. Mm -hmm. there, there were other Picasso exhibitions before. in the US and many other places before that. I see. And uh, were the pictures uh, belonging to his uh, early periods or, or when he became interested in Picasso? Well, <laughs> he may have been interesting all the time, but yeah. uh, it, it, did ex it did extend across his career. Uh, there were very early pictures uh -huh. from, from around 1900 up through pictures of 1932, two years before the exhibition. Another uh, comment or question is that in uh, uh, Gorky's, uh, in the photograph Gorky took to the United yes. States, uh, it's amazing that uh, how much his uh, mother's image looks like a uh, Turkish villagers' uh, yes. art, 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 art wear and everything. Yes. 
I wonder if he had any connections with the Turkic people of the north. <laughs> uh, I, well, maybe you would I'm, investigate about maybe that. Maybe I'll try to find out. <laughs> Fine. There, I, I should tell you, if, if you wanted to investigate that, there are two very good biographies of Gorky yeah. that, that deal with his life uh, in Turkey. One of them is written by really? uh -huh. a what woman named Hayden Herrera, uh -huh. and the other is by Matthew Spender. Okay. And they were published in the last five years. But, but uh, so I should yeah. know. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Professor Östuna from Istanbul. I think I missed the part when you talked about Rosenberg taking the uh, Picasso's works to United States. My question is about why United States, I mean. It's an interesting question. Um, and if he had been operating 10 years before, he probably would not have taken pictures to the United States. He was slow to do that. He waited until into the 1920s to do it. Teşekkür ediyoruz bu güzel konferansı ve soruları cevaplaması için Profesör Michael Fitzgerald'ı.